talks he talks to David, and David is uh, um, uh, hears from Nathan, and and uh, God speaks unto Nathan, and 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 really he, he just lays out some promises there uh, to David, and basically we call it the Davidic covenant. <clears throat> And uh, again, we talked about a few of those things, but <clears throat> we'll look at a couple other verses uh, to back that up. And again, um, he talks about uh, how his seed would uh, reign. And, and again, talking about the Lord, it's, it's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ sets up his, his kingdom in the throne of David, over Israel, and he makes some promises. And again, we see uh, uh, there's uh, the sure mercies of David. We'll look at that in a minute here, and that are promised to David. Again, uh, and yeah. when we look at this, we even see eternal security of the of born again believers uh, for us in this age. But again, he's talking to Israel, and he talks about when Israel does wrong later on that he would. Est- establish Israel when they did wrong instead of cutting them out he would actually uh, chastise them because they're as sons and again we know that right now where we are uh, historically you know the whole world hates the nation of Israel right now pretty much and and again we see prophecy that says you know that uh, Jerusalem would be a cup of trembling to the world and this type of thing and and everyone really you know just wants to destroy that nation. They want Jerusalem, you know, they just really want to do away with everything that has to do with uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because it is a true God. And uh, again, God's going to establish that nation no matter what. And we know they're going to go through great tribulation. We see that again, the time of Jacob's troubles coming up. Uh, as uh, the church age is coming to a close here, it won't be long. and, and uh, you know, the, the Lord's going to call us out, and he's going to establish that nation. Once again, there's a valley of dry bones when he brings that nation together and quickens it. And, and again, he's going to establish a people there that he'll never, uh, uh, like, like remember when Saul disobeyed the Lord, and then basically God cut him off, you know, and, uh, and uh, then raised up David. But after David... He's going to establish that nation, and that nation will never be cut off. Again, he said he'll chasten them as, as sons rather than uh, there. And that's part of this promise and that we see here. So uh, the, the, if you go to Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 42, it says... Uh, O oh Lord God, and this is David speaking, turn not away the face from thine anointed. Remember the, sure, the mercies of David, thy servant. Okay, so again, there's where we get the sure mercies of David. It's also mentioned in Isaiah. Uh, let me see, where is that? Isaiah chapter 55. Let me get there. New Bible here, sort of pages stick together. Isaiah chapter fifty, <clears throat> chapter fifty-five, in verse three, it says, "Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear your, um, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David." And again, when we uh, really study that out, again, uh, that spiritually has an apply application to the church age today and talks about the security of born again believers as the sons of God. And again, we know the Old Testament uh, refers to angels as the sons of God, but in uh, the New Testament, the uh, believer is called the son of God. And we see, of course, in John chapter 1, in verses 11 and 12, I believe, uh, or 12 and 13, John chapter 1, 12 and 13, it says, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then, of course, in John chapter 14, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ talking about that comforter, 
uh, that he would send, you know. And again, it has to do with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and uh, we see that in John chapter 14 in uh, verse... 16, it begins, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be, abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come unto you. Okay, so again, uh, talking about the Spirit of God that dwelleth in you, uh, or dwelleth with you, it says, and he shall be in you. And again, we know when we get saved today, we're sealed on, uh, by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. And uh, again, we have eternal security. So it's a great thing to know uh, these promises. But again, you see them, and it begins with David here, with the sure mercies of David. And um, again, disobedience to this covenant, covenant is punished with chastisement and, and may a loss of blessings, but not a loss of, uh, of uh, uh, salvation. And again, we see that it is applicable to the nation of Israel out there in the millennial kingdom. And again, God talks about that, and that kingdom begins with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, of course, and there's a great white throne judgment after the thousand years, but that kingdom will continue in the new heaven and new earth. Amen. So uh, what a blessing it is. And then, so we uh, sort of talked about these things last week and read it, and I left off uh, uh, last week when we were talking about uh, when David uh, goes before the Lord and... Uh, he starts speaking unto the Lord, and I'm trying to find where, <clears throat> where uh, I left off. And uh, okay, and this is verse 20. It says, "And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake, according." Uh, to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, and there is none like thee. Neither is there any God beside thee, according to all uh, that we uh, have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make an, him a name, and to do... Uh, for you great things and terrible for thy land uh, before thy people which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt from the nation and their gods for thou hast confirmed uh, to thyself thy people Israel to be uh, a people unto thee forever and thou Lord art become their God okay so again it talks about that kingdom that will be established forever. And again, David's going before him, and, and uh, again, David humbles himself in the sight of God here. And, you know, as think about that Romans chapter 1 there. Uh, you know, again, David's got a heart, and again, we, after God's heart, and we know that, uh, you know, David's just a man, and the Bible points it out over and over again, and uh, David has faults, but he does have a heart. And he repents of his sins and gets right with God, and God continues to use him and bless him, uh, though God also chastises him, amen? Uh, but, and we'll see that, of course, as we continue on in here. But uh, uh, what man tends to do is, like in Romans chapter 1, we see where, where uh, man sort of lifts himself up. And again, he, what he does, he acknowledges God... Uh, 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 really on his own level. He creates in God, you know, a God in his own imagination who he wants God to be. And I believe that's what we are seeing really in this world today right now. That's what man is doing is, is they, in their own mind, they have their own God. Even Christians, many times Christians, uh, knowing a little bit of Bible, they might know they're saved, but they don't have 
uh, relationship like they should. They're not studying the Word of God to acknowledge all the attributes of God. And sometimes they make up, uh, they make Jesus who they want Jesus to be rather than who Jesus is. Okay, and when when that happens again, uh, uh, they live according to who, you know, obedient to who they want Jesus to be. Really, according to the dictates of their flesh. Amen. And rather. Uh, then uh, looking look to uh, God. But again, uh, in verse 20 in Romans chapter 1, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood, the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. It says, Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened okay so again they glorify him not as god david you see david when after nathan speaks he glorifies god he goes right to the lord and he glorifies god he acknowledges who he is and how the great and terrible things that god has done for the nation amen and so again we see that with david but again, here in Romans, uh, quite a contrast here. In Romans, in verse 22, it goes on to say, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fooled. And they changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And again, that's what's going on in the world today. They changed God into the image who they want God to be instead of glorifying God as the God that he is, a God of, you know, I mean, he's a God of love, but he's a God of judgment as well. Amen. He's a balanced God. And again, the only way we're going to know him is through this old King James Bible. Amen. We need the word of God. And uh, uh, again, even these Bibles, uh, new Bibles that are out, a lot of them, uh, you know, water down the deity of Christ and this type of thing. So uh, again, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I have a book that I can trust and fully depend upon. But in verse 24, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts uh, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Uh, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and served the, the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And again, that's where we are. We're to the point now, I mean, we see it all around us where they want to serve the creature rather than the creator. Amen. That's how come, you know, everybody's got to be uh, politically correct because they're worried they might, you know, uh, upset their gods, you know, which are is the creature rather than the creator. And so again, uh, uh, it's good to see the contrast there when David acknowledges God as God, amen, and puts him up on the throne where he belongs. And, and again, he realized he's a servant. And I can imagine David thinking about this and contemplating this promise that he had heard, you know. And again, it's, it's, it has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ when it talks about his seed and this type of thing. But, I mean, I could imagine that David was very honored and awestruck when, when he heard this, pro the, the, this prophecy from Nathan. What a great thing that had to be to David, you know, that God would use him and uh, continue on his seed forever. Amen. And, and, uh, and I mean, you know. We're part of that seed because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So what a great thing that will be. And again, we'll rule and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom and forever. We'll, you know, and I think about us part of the uh, sure mercies of David again having to do with us. But, you know, and we always talk about King Jesus. But just think about it. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is more than a servant to a king, amen? We're the bride of Christ. I mean, we're, you know, right now the espoused virgin to the Lord Jesus Christ, but, you know, before that kingdom, you know, we'll join him, and we're the bride of Christ. And it's, it's like it's almost incomprehensible, uh, the, the blessings and the promises in here. I mean, you know, the body of Christ, I mean, that's a great study in itself. But, you know, again, we're exalted. And we talked about, I talked about it last week, how David, or a couple weeks ago, how David took many wives, amen? And, and the Lord Jesus Christ, he has one wife, amen? And it's the church. What a great thing that is, amen? So uh, 
I often thought about, you know, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is much more than just serving a king. Amen. It's much more intimate than that. Amen. So, uh, and again, it starts right here as we walk and get to know our Savior right here. Amen. And so, I mean, out of all people that ever lived, I mean, we should, you know, just glorify God continually. Amen. And he, I mean, you got to let that stuff sink down into your soul and think about it and, and, and uh, meditate on these things that they, you know, uh, what God has done for you and your position and what your eternal position would be. I mean, uh, it's, it's just amazing, you know, when you think about those things. But again, David's praying here in, in uh, verse 25. He says, And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, uh, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. Again, so he's praying this prayer to God, and, and again, he's calling himself a servant, and properly so, amen? And he said, Let thy house be established before thee. Again, putting God in his proper place, amen? That he would be a servant unto the Lord. And... Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's really something when you think about these things. In verse 27, it says, for, for thou, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel has revealed to thy servant, saying, I will be, build thee a house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord uh, God, thou art God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised uh, this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore... Now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue uh, before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Amen. And then again, God does bless that house forever. Amen. And, and uh, of course, because of their disobedience, I mean, when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ came and they refused not to... Uh, see him as the Lord. Again, a lot of them did follow follow the Lord, but as a nation, of course, they denied him. But uh, again, uh, uh, it was because of their arrogance. Again, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that followed even turned against him, you know. And, I mean, a lot of them got upset when Jesus went in and he turned over the tables of the money changers in, in the temple at that point in time because you had some that followed. Of course, they thought that was pretty drastic in that day. But again, you know, uh, he said, you turned the house, my father's house into a den of thieves and this type of thing. And, and again, of course, right after that, he was uh, crucified. And because of that, of course, Israel was scattered amongst the nations. And, you know, now we see that God even working today, drawing them back and working on that nation, preparing them uh, for the kingdom that will be set up. I believe we're very close. Amen. And I know United States... I mean, we got, of course, you know, Trump tries to back Israel and uh, we have all, you know, these characters that are going against that nation. But when we study the Bible, we see that most people do turn against Israel. And uh, I mean, I don't know what they'll go through before God establishes it, but we know the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period will be a horrendous thing for that nation. But then through it, God will establish it. And then, of course, one day after the rapture, we'll come back with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, be with him as he sets up that kingdom and rule and reign with him uh, for that thousand years. And, uh, and uh, what a great, you know, what a time that will be. Amen. I mean, uh, where you have righteousness ruling on this earth instead of... Uh, uh, the government in the hands of uh, corrupt people that are doing it now. So again, we see this uh, covenant established through David. And I'm trying to think if there's anything I miss. I tend to not use my notes when, <laughs> when I'm uh, teaching. I have them all right here, but I sort of go through them ahead of time. And then when I get into the book, I actually... Set, sort of set them aside, look at them on occasion. Uh, so again, 
he puts puts God in the in in the right place. David does so. Uh, again, we read through the Psalms many times and, and see how David uh, meditated uh, before the Lord and stuff. And uh, several times we actually had looked at those when David was going through different situations. So let's go into chapter eight for a little bit here, and uh, uh, it's, a sh it's sort of a short chapter, but. Uh, and some people believe that chapter 8 actually happened before chapter 7 because at this point in time, David uh, is at war with the Philistines and stuff. And when we begin chapter 7 there, uh, it says uh, in verse 1 in chapter 7, it says, And it came to pass when the king sat on his throne, the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Okay, so again, here he has rest. So sometimes when we read the Bible and stuff, and probably if you go through Chronicles, you could get a, uh, a better uh, or another view of that. But uh, different things that I have read and, and different commentators believe that chapter 7 was after uh, this uh, here. Because, again, there's wars here with the Philistines and, and stuff. So uh, that is a possibility. But I'm not 100% convinced of that. But I just thought I'd put it forth. Okay, so in uh, chapter 8, it says, And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took uh, Methagama out of the hand of the Philistines. And uh, that city there that he's talking about is also the same as uh, uh, the city of Gath. Okay, and it just, uh, there's another name for uh, another name, and I had a reference for that, and I believe it's in First Chronicles 18:1. 1. First Chronicles 18:1, 1, where it calls it Gath. And it says, uh, Now after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them, and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. Then smote Moab and the Moabites and, and, and David's servants uh, and brought gifts. Okay, so again, it's talking about the same thing if you continue on. It talks about the, uh, it, it's uh, the same account, but again, it calls it Gath. But in verse 2, it says, And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, even two lines measured he to put to death and one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and, and brought gifts. And so again, he chooses at that point in time some that would uh, become his servants and others that would be put to death uh, of these soldiers. And again, I was thinking about that also. It wasn't too long ago when we see uh, after David left the cave of Adullam in 1 Samuel 22, I believe it is. And uh, yeah, it was 1 Samuel uh, 22. And uh, it says in verse 1, David therefore departed thence and escaped uh, the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and his all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him, and everyone that was uh, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone uh, that was discontent, or gathered uh, themselves unto him, and he became captain over them. Uh, were about four hundred men. Okay, in verse three, this is what I wanted. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, "Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth." and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt uh, with him all the while that David was in the hold. So again, he, here, you know, uh, after the, that point in time, he had taken his parents to the king of Moab to, to uh, uh, really be taken care of and be there peacefully while, again, he was running from Saul. And so uh, here he takes, uh, uh, takes his, or is actually uh, going after them. And again, David's great-grandmother was Ruth, who was a Moabite. Okay, so, and he trusted his parents to the Moabites. But then uh, now, 
uh, he's at war with them. And I've read possibly that it may be that he mistreated, uh, the Moabites mistreated, or, you know, his parents and his family in some way or another, or maybe he had something, uh, you know, against them. But again, here we see he, he uh, uh, goes up against Moab. Okay, and then verse 3, it says, And David smote Hadadezer, uh, the son of Rehob, the son of uh, Zobah, and went uh, to recover his border at the river uh, Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand uh, footmen. And David uh, held all the chariots and horses, but uh, reserved of them for a hundred for in hundred chariots. And again, uh, there's 700 horsemen and, and 20,000 footmen. And of course, David uh, kills most of the, the chariots and horses. And again, um, it was probably too much for him to care for, you know, to keep uh, that many horses alive and, and deal with that from different things I read, of course. And again, there's uh, verses in Deuteronomy chapter 17, which we have looked at before when it talked about... Uh, uh, the same chapter that talked about not taking many wives, which of course David did. Uh, let me find that verse here. And in verse 16, it says, But he shall not multiply. Actually, let's back up a little bit in verse 15. It says, uh, Thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But thou shalt not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, uh, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye, sh ye shall henceforth return no more that way. And again, you know, David is dependent on God. He's not dependent upon horses. A lot of times we depend on the equipment we own, we think, or what it, our armies and stuff, whatever, uh, uh, you know, we have physically. And we see that happens all the time where it's the few many times that, especially when it comes to the nation of Israel, a lot of times they defeat their enemies, which are a lot bigger than themselves, have a lot more men, and they're few in number, and of course God gives them the victory. And again, it, it, God does that to show His glory, amen, where uh, the weak and, you know, the weaker seems to overtake that which uh, looks from the world's point of view as being stronger. And again, uh, you know, when, you, when you're on the right side, amen, no telling what God can do, amen. But again, uh, uh, another thing I wanted to mention there. Oh, and when it talks about to recover his border at the river Euphrates, again, God gives uh, uh, Abraham a land grant. And uh, David pretty much... Uh, had under his reign recovered all the land that God had given unto Abraham, Amen. And and uh, so I mean he's down past to the river Euphrates there. And again, in I think it's around Genesis chapter 15 when God gives Abraham that land grant and tells him, you know, and he tells him and he's in the mountain. And he tells him to look out over here to the east, to the west, north, and God says all that land that you can see. I'm going to give it to you. And again, he's talking about the nation of Israel. Again, Abraham never uh, uh, seen it, but then again, it's fully going to be uh, under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll have all that land. Amen. So, but again, uh, so here we see that David uh, destroys many of them uh, soldiers and, and the horses, but he reserves a hundred of them. And uh, verse 5, it says, And when the Syrians of Damascus came to Sakur Hadazer, the king of Zobah, David slew the Syrians, two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in the uh, Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David 
whithersoever he went. One thing we, when we look at Israel, again, Israel didn't always have to uh, uh, wipe out all their enemies, amen? Basically, they needed to be acknowledged as a stronger nation, amen? And, uh, and uh, then again, they gave tribute to the nation of Israel after they became the servants of the nation of Israel. And one thing I think we can learn as uh, uh, church-age Christians, I mean, there's people out there that are not saved, and, you know, they're not all enemies of God. Some of them just need to be, uh, hear the word of God. We need to talk to them. But again, we deal kindly with them. You know, the Bible says uh, you need to show yourself friendly to have friends. You know, and sometimes, uh, uh, again, sometimes we can come down pretty hard on people that are not saved. But again, and just be a, a testimony and witness to them and show yourself friendly to them and kind. And I'm sure many of you probably seen people say because of your kindness uh, towards them. And they said, man, that individual, you know, he's always showing me kindness, you know, and he talks about the Lord and, and he's... You know, he, he seems to live a godly life. I, I need what he has, you know, and they might see God working through you. And again, uh, I'm sure these nations round about uh, understood that David and the nation of Israel had the hand of God upon them because, again, the great strength that they showed. And, uh, and uh, you know, they just saw the blessings of God. I mean, how many times have you got a phone call from someone you know that's unsaved and says, can you pray for me? You know, and tell you about the situation. Why? Because they, they, they know that. They, they see the hand of God in your life. Amen. They see the blessings of God in your life and they're like, you know, I know who I can call and who will pray for me. And, and you know, and many times it's just because they don't know. And even though you witness to them, you know, it takes time sometimes for the Holy Spirit of God to work in that individual's heart. I mean, I, I look back uh, from when I first got witness to until the point I got saved. And I've seen several years where the Lord had dealt with my heart through individuals that had talked to me before I finally got saved. And uh, I mean, I, I was convinced that the Word of God was true before I got saved because I had individuals talking about the Bible and different things that it had said and different prophecies and that type of thing. And then finally, God just put me in the right place where someone opened it up and, and gave me the plan of salvation as well. So, but it was, it was years that the Lord worked on my heart. And it's the same way with many of us, especially family members and friends that we work with and they watch you and they see you. And then when they get in trouble, they're like, I want... I want him to pray because I know that he's walking with God. That was the same thing with the nation of, of Israel. David, uh, again, had, you know, people saw the blessings of God there, and they saw the strength of David, and they, again, uh, uh, David was doing it with a smaller army than, than uh, the, the people he had defeated in, in most cases. So, again, it was an interesting thing when you uh, look at these. It says... Uh, uh, we'll go a few more verses and then we'll stop. But it says, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadizer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beda and from uh, Beth Bethriah, uh, the cities of Hadizer, King David took exceeding much brass. And when we look at these things and uh, what David's doing, he's what he's doing, he's saving up the things that he's taken, again, to because he he wants to build a... Uh, temple for the Lord uh, to put the uh, to put the uh, Ark of the Covenant in, you know, because again, that's the dwelling place of God at that time. I mean, uh, and uh, again, you know, David felt guilty that it dwelt in a tent that you know God dwelt in a tent where He dwelt in a palace, you know, a house of cedar. And so again, He's wanting to do it, and then again, I, and we'll look at it next week because I'm out of time. But uh, God wouldn't allow David to do it because, again, he's a man of war. But he allows his son Solomon to build the temple. But David's getting ready for it. He's preparing for it. Amen. He's, he's uh, uh, bringing every, a lot of the spoils that he brought. He's bringing them to uh, and storing them up and getting them ready. He's dedicating them to, to the house of God. 
And again, we could even see that happen with uh, Moses before the Israelites left Egypt. What they do, they went and borrowed these things from the Egyptians, it said. They borrow, borrowed silver and gold and earrings and jewels and all, all types of stuff. And then when they crossed uh, the Red Sea there and, and God gave uh, Moses the plan of the tabernacle, they used these things to build the tabernacle. And again, Moses gives them a, a, the plan and you know, all the furniture in the tabernacles all made out of shit and wood overlaid in gold and stuff like that. So, uh, and then they had, you know, great craftsmen that God gave them their ability to do these things. And the same thing's going to happen here with the temple. And, and uh, uh, when he takes these things, uh, the brass and the gold and silver from uh, many of its recovered, or he gets from... Uh, enemies that they fight, but he's dedicating it to the, th to the temple of God or to the, uh, and eventually uh, uh, Solomon will build the temple with these. But we'll look at that more next week and we'll finish that chapter next week and probably get into chapter nine next week. But let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank you for the opportunity to be here, Father. We're thankful for uh, uh, the sure mercies of David, Lord, that we could see them in our life. God, what a great thing they are uh, to know and uh, that you have blessed us and sealed us by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. What a blessing that is. It's a blessing to know that we are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. And again, we just pray, Lord, that uh, you bless the upcoming service. Use our pastor, Lord, as uh, he preaches and teaches us from your word, Father, and pray. God, that you'd bless all that enter in uh, the doors here today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.